the next question would follow would be, would it be your intention that every bill we do, we have to pertain to the Constitution and what you're thinking about? Is it constitutionally right or wrong? And that's, I guess, maybe because of words in there, I'm just wondering what you're getting at. Are you trying to say, okay, every bill that comes in the House and you sponsor, you've got to check it over to make sure it's constitutionally effective? I mean, that's what I'm reading here, and I'm not sure if I'm right. of the United States of America in order to protect state sovereignty and the chair will call on the prime sponsor of the bill, Representative Itzel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Itzel, before you start, can somebody close the door, please? Sure. Thank you. Close the door, last one in. Excuse me. Excuse me. Welcome. Thank you, Representative, uh, my fellow representatives on the committee. I uh, appreciate you hearing us today at this uh, late hour. The reason that I uh, submitted uh, House Bill 1343 is last year I submitted HCR 6, as you all recall, and one of the things that was considered a defect to it was that it didn't actually do anything. It was uh, simply uh, hortatory language that gave encouragement uh, to the United States to uh, stay within their constitutional bounds. And so, looking at the language of HCR 6, and which states that it's one of the rightful duties of the states, having created the United States of America, to make sure that it does stay within its constitutional bounds, I consider that what we really needed to do was create a capacity to for us to consider as, as a body what laws might be unconstitutional. You know, like no real ID as we've done in the past. And uh, I, so I took all of the nice language and I put it up as a set of findings and then uh, proposed that we create a joint committee of the House and Senate that when constituents raise a clamor about something, uh, being a usurpation of their uh, rights, that we would have something already in place to dutifully consider it. That would be the, the function of this joint committee. It might consider one thing a session, or it might consider 20 things a session. And then, uh, because ultimately, as we've seen in some of the states uh, where they have uh, sought to prohibit an action of the federal government. The federal government says, I don't care. Uh, I propose that we might also consider, if necessary, punishing the enforcement of something we consider to be unconstitutional. And that because we have right now a, a definite lack as, as an entity to communicate with our sister states uh, as legislatures, that one of the duties, or the third duty of this committee, would be to actually communicate <coughs> with committees formed in other states for the same purpose. Tennessee has done so. They have a, uh, a committee to uh, consider the constitutionality of federal actions. And, you know, so we might talk to them and say, gee, what are you guys talking about? And they would tell us and ask us what we were talking about. That's the nugget of the bill, and the, the final thing that I propose uh, and protect is that nothing uh, about the existence of this committee would ever prevent an individual legislator from taking similar actions as we did with uh, no real ID and or uh, prohibit the, uh, the governor from pursuing action uh, via the judicial system uh, at using the services of the attorney general. That's what this bill does. 
is designed to protect the sovereignty of our state. The people of this state have the sole and exclusive right of governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent state, and do and forever hereafter shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right pertaining thereto, which is not, or may not hereafter be by them, expressly delegated to the United States of America in Congress assembled. And that was last ratified in 1792 after the Constitution for the United States. That was when, when the 13, or actually the, well, when the 13 original states became members or created the United States and, and, and created that government, that was the understanding they had of the relationship. So that is still the relationship that exists today. And I have some evidence of that for you. I, this is for the committee. <laughs> Lars? This is Federalist Paper 41 that I'm passing out to you. Federalist Paper 41 was written by James Madison, who also happens to have written, among other sections of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, which defines the powers of the government of the United States. And one of the things that was being argued by the anti-federalists was that they, they thought that this, this Constitution gave too much power to the federal government because in the first clause of that sentence that comprises Article 1, Section 8, that it said that the United States had the power to lay and collect taxes for paying the debts and providing for the common defense and the general welfare. And they said that would allow them to make any law they wanted. Well, James Madison said, well, this is really a specious argument for two reasons. First reason is, that's already the language of the Articles of Confederation, so if you don't like it here, you wouldn't have liked it there, and, and having it here doesn't change anything. The second reason is that the next several <coughs> phrases in that sentence, which enumerate what they meant by providing for the common defense and the general welfare, define what they meant by providing for the common defense and general welfare. And James Madison says, this is a common uh, uh, tactic in the English language. You make a general statement, and then you define it. And so that those who are arguing against the adoption, they're either being disingenuous in their objection, or they don't know how to read English. And so when anybody tells you that that first sentence fragment in Article 1, Section 8 gives the general government the power to do anything they want, James Madison, the one who wrote it, would tell you they're either lying or they're ignorant. That's a paraphrase, but that is the section of this Federalist paper that I've highlighted for you in the last two pages where he goes into that explanation. So I hope you won't doubt the way I've paraphrased it for you because you can read it for yourself. That is the same uh, view that uh, Jefferson and Madison espoused in the, the um, Kentucky <laughs> Resolutions that HCR 6 was derived from when uh, they said if you interpret it that way you destroy the rest of the document. I think those are pretty harsh words, but that was what the guy who wrote it ascribed to. And so I hope that this committee will find it to take up their proper interpository role to protect the citizens of New Hampshire from usurpations by the general government. And of course, we also have to from usurpation by our government, but that goes without saying. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Um, I have one or two. Uh, 
I'm looking at the analysis of the bill, and the committee is 